someone who's become quite a beloved figure in the New Age and alternative healing communities over the past few decades is Dr. Joe Dispenza. His miraculous story about healing his broken spine with just the power of his mind has captivated millions of people and pulled them into his teachings about mind-body medicine and something he calls coherence healing, where groups of his followers come together and completely heal others of their terminal and chronic illnesses and disabilities. He's committed his life to spreading the power of meditation and demystifying the mystical by conducting research on neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics to show how consciousness affects every area of our lives. But not everyone is allured by his anecdotes. He's been described by some as a fraud, a quack, a snake oil salesman, a pseudoscientist. Many people wonder, where is all the scientific research to back this stuff up? Well, that's part of what we're going to talk about in this video here today. I'm going to start out with a little bit of an introduction on who he is, talk about his sources of income, then we'll go into how recently his retreats have been described by some as being culty after OG beauty YouTuber Michelle Fawn shared her experience at one of them. We'll see what's up with his coherence healing, you know, are people really being healed? of like chronic illnesses, disabilities, all through the power of the mind of his followers. That'll lead into his personal story about how he healed his broken spine, and then we're gonna finish up with what he calls the proof um, that he provides on his website for these teachings. So Joe Dispenza was born in 1962, making him 60 years old as of filming this video. He is a doctor of chiropractic, not a medical doctor. He got his degree from Life University College of Chiropractic Education in Georgia, which in 2002 had its accreditation status revoked by the Commission on Accreditation of the Council on Chiropractic Education because, apparently, students were not being taught how to detect and deal with problems that require medical attention. Whoops. Joe says his postgraduate training includes the fields of neuroscience and neuroplasticity, quantitative, electroencephalogram, measurements, epigenetics, mind-body medicine, and brain-heart coherence. Some sites say that he studied biochemistry at Rutgers University in New Jersey, but I don't think he got a degree from that. He apparently has a bachelor's in science from Evergreen State College in Washington. On some websites, it says he got that degree with an emphasis in neurology. Um, I don't believe that's the same thing as like having a degree in neurology, but I don't really know the difference. Sorry, I misspoke there. I meant to say neuroscience, not neurology. At some point, Joe was a student of Ramtha's School of Enlightenment, which was founded by a woman named Jay-Z Knight, who claims that she can channel a 35,000-year-old being called Ramtha the Enlightened One. It's basically like a new age self-development group with some right-wing beliefs, and they claim to base their teachings on ancient wisdom, you know, from Rantha. He's 35,000 years old, pretty ancient, and it's often described as a cult. Former students have accused the school of mind control, brainwashing, intimidation, and fear tactics to keep students from leaving. I've seen things on their website that support anti-vax beliefs like the flu shot causes cancer and Down syndrome, and some chemtrail conspiracies, they believe in telepathy, and teach that anyone can see the past or future of anything at any time. On their website it says, regarding Jay-Z, historians and religious experts who have studied her life's work call Jay-Z Knight the Great American Channel and recognize her as one of the most charismatic and compelling spiritual leaders of the modern age. That's the thing you can kind of read and automatically see as a red flag, like in general, but also of like culty vibes, you know? There's not a whole lot of information out there connecting Joe to this group. It's certain that he was a part of it because, for example, in a 1997 Washington Post article, he, or he says that in this school, seeing is not believing, believing is seeing. So we know that he was part of it. Um, and it's not like I searched for hours and hours to try to find all the information on this group that I can because it's really not that much, it's not that important of a part of this video. But there's just, there's not a lot of sites talking about it. I haven't been able to find anything else he has said specifically on the group. The things that I have seen, it's like from one source each. There's not a bunch of different sources corroborating it. So I don't know if any of these things are true, but like, for example, I've seen that he was a teacher for them between 1997 and 2005. I read in a Reddit comment from somebody who claimed that Joe was his personal chiropractor, that Joe had been kicked out of the group. 
One person on some forum said that he was dismissed from Ramtha's School of Enlightenment for going against their practice of non-public disclosure of the teaching without the consent of Ramtha's School of Enlightenment. The group is so obviously culty. I'm not gonna call them a cult. I don't want to get sued, blah, blah, blah. But culty vibes, okay? I don't think I can get sued for that. I, I just feel like Joe seems like he has too much common sense to become involved like, with a group like this. But I mean, there was decades ago that he would have been a part of it, so I don't know. The reason why it was important to bring this up is because Joe's current beliefs and teachings are very similar to this group's. I don't know why he joined, why he left, you know, those kind of details are uncertain. But what is certain is that many of Joe's current beliefs and teachings were taken from Ramtha's School of Enlightenment or based on their teachings. I find this group to be really interesting and I think it would be fun to maybe make a video on them, so if you would be interested in that, let me know below. Today, Dispenza is a New York Times bestselling author, but I mean, who isn't these days? He has over 2 million Instagram followers, but not even a Wikipedia page. He lives in Washington, kind of jealous. Uh, there's a podcast called Conspirituality where they talk about Joe in episode 98, Placebo Joe Dispenza, it's called. They say that Joe's chiropractic license expired in Washington a couple years ago, although I'm not sure what the source for that was. Um, like they didn't have it linked or anything. And I tried to look it up and I couldn't find anything. Even if it didn't expire, just like in my last video about Deepak Chopra, these guys who go from like, being doctors, doing doctor stuff, uh, to being more public figures and having retreats and websites and all that stuff. Uh, I don't think they're really still doing the doctor stuff because they would make way more money from the public figure related duties. <laughs> Nowadays, he is promoting self-development and healing through meditation, something he calls the formula, and brain-heart coherence, which is the basis of the coherence healing that I mentioned earlier. Those seem to be his main teachings, so I'm going to read to you what he writes about those so you can get an idea of what he's all about uh, right off the bat here. When I talk about the formula, people often think it's an actual mathematical equation like E equals MC squared. What I really mean by the formula is a specific process and technique for people to alter the way they focus their attention, self-regulate, learn how to change their emotional state, and open their heart which, when done, properly results in a new life, a healed body, or a new reality. For the purpose of this brief explanation, the formula is a twofold process which requires a person to create and sustain both heart and brain coherence at the same time. Brain coherence. To create brain coherence, we teach people to move from habituated states in which their energy and attention are focused on perceived threats in their external environment or the material world to a broader focus in which their attention is on energy, the energy in the space around their body, and the unifying field of energy in which we are all connected. By feeling, experiencing, noticing, surrendering to, connecting to, and unifying this infinite field of energy, the signature of which is oneness and wholeness, as our brains entrain to this energy, parts of our brains that we once that were once subdivided and compartmentalized because of the hormones of stress begin to organize, become coherent, and synchronize. Heart coherence. When you live by emotions such as resentment, fear, jealousy, impatience, anxiety, judgment, overwhelm, and so on, these limited emotional states cause your heart to beat out of rhythm. When this happens, the fight or flight system switches on. The only problem is you're not running, fighting, or hiding. If this continues for prolonged periods of time, the body gets knocked out of homeostasis, the optimal state of balance. Very often, this dis-ease is the precursor to chronic health conditions and illnesses. The formula, whether you're seeking abundance, love, healing, or new career, an essential part of the creation process is marrying a coherent brain, selecting a clear intention or a new potential in the quantum field, with a coherent heart, an elevated emotion. Said another way, in the creative process, the thought sends the signal out and the feeling draws the event back to you. This elevated, heart-centered emotion is what you will feel when your creation comes to fruition. The key, is to the key is to sustain the elevated state and to become really good at producing and maintaining it. 
When it feels as if your future has already happened, you stop looking for it. And the side effect is that you start falling in love with your life. If you go back to looking for that new future, however, you're back to duality and separation. So he doesn't really mention meditation there, but I believe in order to get into brain-heart coherence, you get into kind of like a meditative state, use the formula to achieve a desired outcome for yourself, or you can do it for other people in the coherence healing. More on that later though. For now, let's talk about his different ways of making money. This might not be all of them, but it's the main ones, I think. So. He is an author, first and foremost. He has written some books such as Becoming Supernatural, How Common People Are Doing the Uncommon, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, How to Lose Your Mind and Create a New One, Evolve Your Brain, The Science of Changing Your Mind, You Are the Placebo, Making Your Mind Matter. I want to talk briefly about this concept right now. So the placebo effect occurs when a person believes they're receiving a real treatment and that produces biological changes in the body as if they were receiving real treatment. It's interestingly also been found that patients who know they're taking a placebo can experience the placebo effect as well. But while placebos can make you feel better, they don't cure things. That's where Joe differs from the real science on this subject though. He believes that like our minds can create a placebo effect without taking any real medicine or placebo medicine. If we can just convince ourselves that we're healing, then we will experience healing just like how the placebo effect works. But not just a reduction in pain or fatigue like what the actual science shows, he believes that the placebo, the mind placebo, can reverse cancer and heart disease. He also has courses that he sells on his website. There's like two bigger ones. So the first one is the formula, which has 12, 30 to 40 minute lessons and five meditations to introduce you to the scientifically proven formula for personal transformation based on the research that Joe has been learning about for years. That is $225. There's an intensive course for $200 containing 8 hours of instructional videos and meditations and a progressive and intensive course bundle for $299 containing 23 hours of that same stuff, videos, meditations. Um, I guess you can't get the progressive one alone. You have to buy the bundle or just the intensive one. I'm not sure why, but I guess I think you could say that like basically the course is about mental transformation and through that physical transformation. He has cheaper courses um, that are between like $13 and $18 that are audio lectures which run from about 45 minutes to 2 hours. Their titles include things like Pulling the Mind Out of the Body, What Am I Doing Wrong, Welcome to the World of Change, Information to Transformation, Turning Knowledge into Action. He has meditations, um, his meditations are between $20 and $35 and are each between 15 and 70 minutes absolutely ridiculous. Like these three, generating change, generating inspiration, and generating flow are each $25 and 15 minutes each. I really just can't believe it. Like I see so many people selling meditations for such high prices when there's so many for free. It drives me nuts. I don't know why, but I mean, spend your money on what you want, I guess. He has something called Dr. Joe Live. On the last Thursday of every month, he basically has this hour-long Zoom call. He discusses a topic sometimes for like the first 30 minutes of it, and then the second 30 minutes is the, a Q&A, um, or sometimes the entire time, entire hours voted, devoted to a Q&A. You have to pay $10 per month to access this, so $10 for one hour-long Zoom call. And that money, you're paying just to watch the things. Like, you might not even get your question answered, which is a great way for them to get you to come back month to month and keep paying that 10 bucks, you know? Biosyntropy. This is a vitamin and supplement company, and Joe says the products are intended to help the body, and specifically hormones, become balanced, which will help people recover from health issues. They have three products on the site, all of which contain vitamins, minerals, herbs, and amino acids. The first one, Heart Center Boost, is intended to promote a stronger immune system. When you see the word um, promote or any other like really vague terms, another one he'll use later is enhance. Uh, when you see those in the description of health products, that should be a red flag. Like the reason it's vague is because if you use terms that are like regulated, um, you can't do that if you don't have any scientific research to back up your claims. So he has to use words like promote and enhance because I don't think there's 
any research to back up these things, at least I didn't see any. So for that heart stuff, you get 30 servings of, it's like powder that you mix with water for $70. <laughs> I think I'd rather just get a multivitamin from the grocery store, which would be like less than half the price. Pineal power is $60 for 30 servings and is meant to enhance your brain function and clarity. And lastly, the pineal chill is $50 for 90 capsules. You're supposed to take three at a time before you go to bed to promote calm and relaxation so you get better sleep. Neuro Change Solutions. This is a corporate training company that uses models for the neuroscience of change created by Joe to help improve businesses. The site says that Joe is personally trained and certified over 120 consultants who work at this company and they teach his methods of transformation in order to become one of these consultants. You must have attended two types of Joe's retreats, which I'll type of, talk about those different types later. You must have read and studied four of his books and of course like have corporate training skills and all that already. On his website, drjoedispenza.com, he has a shop section, lots of different random things he's selling. I mean, he has like his books, his courses, meditations on here, but he also has things like a pop-up phone stand, a journal, some different clothing items, uh, some peaceful meditative music. Joe appeared in the film What the Bleep Do We Know, which attempts to draw a connection between quantum physics and consciousness. It's a very popular film in the New Age community. I'm for once not going to talk about quantum physics in this video, mainly because I forgot to add it to my script and didn't realize that till like an hour ago, but um, I'm sure it'll be nice for those of you who watch a lot of my videos to not have to hear me repeat the same things over and over, but if you're not familiar with um, kind of the arguments against people like Joe Dispenza who try to connect quantum physics and consciousness, um, I recommend the video called Quantum Mysticism is Stupid by Professor Dave Explains. Uh, check that out if you are interested, but I'm not going to talk about anything related to quantum physics and Joe's perspective on that topic in this video. An interesting little fact about what the bleep do we know that I didn't know about because I've never seen the film and I actually don't know if it's clear if you've seen the film that this is a fun fact about it, but it was actually written, directed, and produced by three members of Ramtha's School of Enlightenment. So it like was kind of a promotion of this school's beliefs. So I'm guessing that was why Joe ended up appearing in the film because like a source earlier said that he was a teacher at the school from 1997 to 2005. So when the film came out in 2004, I assume he was part of the school at that time. He was also in part two of that film, Down the Rabbit Hole. He was in another film called The People versus The State of Illusion, and he's also a frequenter of the new age streaming service Guy TV. I have a video on Guy TV if you'd like to check it out. He has his own series on there called Rewired, and then he's also just featured in other like shows and movies on that. He might have some other sources of income that I haven't listed there, but the last one that I want to talk about is his retreats. Dr. Dispenza hosts his own retreats multiple times a year, and they recently come into the news a little bit. I mean, not they weren't on like Good Morning America or anything. I mean, more like uh, YouTube drama news. <laughs> uh, one of the OG beauty YouTubers, Michelle Fawn, some of you may have heard of her, some of you may not have, um, but she recently went to one of his retreats and shared her experience. I think she went to one in May, so this is very recent. Videos about this situation have been titled, Is Michelle Fawn in a cult? I'm worried about Michelle Fawn. Beauty YouTube OG Michelle Fawn joined a cult. Um, so let's kind of look at this. Are his retreats creating a cult-like atmosphere? Let's check it out. So Joe has four different types of retreats. Actually, a new type was added to the website since I researched this. So there's five types and I'll do a voiceover about the extra one in a bit. The first one is called progressive retreats. And the only thing listed in this area of his website is the progressive and intensive online bundle course that I mentioned earlier. I think that that and like the progressive treat are kind of equivalent in some sort of way um, but i'm not sure why there's no actual live retreat for this some key details about the course though it's supposed to push you out of your comfort zone and help you overcome challenges meditation is a big part of all the retreats it's stated that joe teaches a new language and paradigm that ultimately helps students understand themselves the world around them 
and the power of directed consciousness to alter outcomes. He says that his teachings combine multiple different fields, which I'm going to list and briefly explain like what they are. So it combines quantum physics, the study of the behavior of matter and energy at atomic and subatomic levels, neuroscience, the study of the nervous system, neuroendocrinology, the study of the interaction between hormones and the brain, Psycho psychoneuroimmunology, the study of the relationship between the nervous system and the immune system, epigenetics, the study of how behaviors and the environment ch can change the way genes work, and electromagnetism, the study of the electromagnetic force. It apparently combines all those things to help you tap into your full potential. And maybe it does, uh, but I honestly get the impression that he just puts all these really big words like psycho neuroimmunology. I mean, who's really heard of that unless you're like a doctor or you studied medicine in, in school? Um, most people don't know what these things are. They're just big words and scientific words, so they make it sound like he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's talking about. So you must have completed this type of retreat in order to qualify for the next type of retreat, which is the week-long advanced retreats. These are actual physical retreats that last seven days, and they all take place, uh, or they take place all over the world. He has some coming up in Cancun, Mexico, London, New York, Texas, Florida, and they each cost between $2,000 and $2,300, which seems pretty cheap compared to a lot of retreats that I've looked at um, that are like a week long, but the, the little tricky thing here is that the cost of accommodation and sometimes food is not included in that, so you got to pay for like hotels. Sometimes you're only allowed to go to certain hotels that are like, like 150 to like 220, I think I've seen dollars a night. Uh, so you don't have your own options. Sometimes, sometimes you do, but it's reported that this is the type of retreat that Michelle went to. This one expands on the information in the progressive retreater course. So you're kind of expected to like have a good knowledge of that first course. Um, and he just jumps right back in or right into like expanding upon this information once you get to this advanced retreat. Lots else goes on here though. It says that you will experience miracles. You'll practice multiple types of meditation. I think they're walking, standing, lying down and sitting. You'll learn how to heal another person in our coherence healing. Joe will teach you how to train your brain and body to go into a trance. You will program your subconscious mind, find out the formula for how to have mystical experiences and be part of a like-minded community. You have to have attended one of those retreats in order to qualify for the next type, which is the advanced follow-up retreats. These are four day long retreats for $1,100 and just meant to help people dive deeper into the work, it says. There's one called Unlimited Youth Retreat, which is $499 and lasts for three days. And this is for people aged 13 to 26. Then lastly, he has special retreats. These are apparently smaller week-long tours, but there's none listed on the site. So I don't have any other details for you for that one. So those are his four different types of retreats. Now let's go into Michelle Fawn, what she said on her, in her Instagram stories about this retreat that made people question if she was in a cult. I'm really not sure the order of some of these uh, pictures, screenshots, and I'm not going to read all of them, but hopefully it's still coherent. Wow. Taking time absorbing everything I experienced in the past seven days. I've never been around so much loving energy. It was incredibly healing. I've always resonated with Dr. Joe Dispenza's story on how he transformed himself using brain and heart coherence. This is the most important work I've ever done for myself. I can't even begin to articulate how incredibly life-changing today was. I'm still processing all the miracles I witnessed and the miracle I became today. I finally felt what true love is, not in a romantic sense, divine love. This was all through intentional meditation with breath work. The people in this retreat, wow, I've never ever ever experienced so much love from strangers my entire life. I never felt so safe. This is the most love I've ever received. I saw angels. I experienced complete bliss and joy that I've never ever experienced in my life. I healed a man who was in a wheelchair for years. He's not only walking now, but dancing with joy. 
My favorite part of all of this is the coherent healing sessions where we heal people with pain, illness, etc. using the intentional meditation technique and breath work. One more note, this meditation retreat is not one of those relaxing spa ones. My friends think I'm relaxing and chilling. Nah bro, I'm working. I'm clocking in 4 hours of sleep every day. Waking up at 3 a.m. to meditate for 5 hours straight, no breaks, not even for bathroom. Then we eat, then learn science for 2 hours, then meditation again. Then break, and then meditate again. It's work. So let's first talk about the cult vibes, and then talk about what's going to stand out to anyone, which is her claim that she healed somebody who was in a wheelchair for years. So for the cult aspect, I'm going to use something called the bite model, which outlines specific methods that cults use to recruit and maintain members, which fall into one of four control categories. There's behavior, information, thought, and emotional control, and kind of use that to highlight some suspicious things. So just looking at the retreat descriptions on the website, for the progressive retreat or course, it states that Joe teaches a new language and paradigm, and the advanced retreats say that you will learn how to program your subconscious mind. Those may be like innocent, harmless things, I guess, but they could be considered a form of thought control where they're trying to instill a new map of reality. It's hard to say without knowing more information, but just the way they sound, not a green flag. <laughs> Another form of thought control could be him teaching people how to go into a trance. On the bite model, this would fit into the category of teaching thought stopping techniques which shut down reality testing by stopping negative thoughts and allowing only positive thoughts or hypnotic techniques to alter mental states undermine critical thinking and even age regress the member the bite model also lists meditation as a possible uh, thought stopping technique but that doesn't mean it's always that way it's just that it could possibly be used in that way um, and i don't have any evidence or really reason to think that the type of meditations that Joe teaches are thought stopping techniques. So I'm not going to like say that those, the meditation aspect gives me culty vibes. Um, then looking at Michelle's experience, the loving energy, divine love, the most love she's ever received. I've seen multiple creators who have made videos about this situation say that this could be a potential form of love bombing which if you don't know is a manipulation tactic and form of emotional control where you try to influence somebody with an over-the-top expression of affection. I'm not remotely an expert in cults um, or manipulation tactics. I'm not trying to present myself as that regarding any of these different things. But from my understanding of all this stuff, I don't really see how all, like all these people are just coming to this retreat. They're complete strangers. I don't see any motive that each of these members would have for trying to manipulate uh, or love bomb anyone else at the retreat. Um, it's just a lack of motive for me, the lack of like, what are they getting out of it? I don't see them getting anything out of it. It's a seven day long retreat. The only thing that I could see is like, maybe the the teachings of the retreat being in a way where they are encouraging members to love bomb unintentionally love bomb um because the creators like joe um would have a financial motive you know they want the attendees to have the best experience ever and want to continue coming back maybe for the follow-up retreats or purchase their other courses or whatever or just um give positive pr promotion for the retreats so they would have a motive for getting people to love bomb or it may be just taught unintentionally, I'm not sure. But I also do see people say this about just a lot of retreats, like any different type of retreat led by any person, but with any different subject or whatever, people always meet the most amazing people in the world at these retreats, which is great for them, I'm happy for them, but I wouldn't say it is special for this retreat. Next, one of the things Michelle says is, this is the most important work I've ever done for myself. And I've seen other followers of Joe say the same kind of thing. And it makes me wonder if he is kind of telling people, uh, trying to like influence people to believe this by saying, 
hey guys, like this is the most important work you will ever do for yourself. And so it kind of like tricks them into believing it because he's telling them it as if it were a fact. Um, it might be a form of thought control, although I'm not sure which specific category on the bite model it would fall into. So many people were alarmed by the details about having to meditate for five hours straight with no bathroom breaks and then only getting four hours of sleep a night. I think that's pretty extreme. You know, I've been to a 10 day Vipassana meditation retreat where we were meditating for, I believe, about 10 and a half hours a day. And my experience was not like that at all. Like, we were allowed to go potty, you know? When we meditated in the meditation hall, it was discouraged. Like, they tried to tell people, like, you know, go before you come so you don't have to get up and go. But those only lasted for two hours maximum, never five hours. And you were allowed to go. Like, they're not going to stop you. There were people that did get up uh, from time to time. To go to the bathroom and then we were getting done with meditation at like 9 or 9 30 and then we were woken up at 6 a.m so that's like seven hours of sleep that you could get if you can fall asleep fast and then there was four and a half hours of breaks during the day uh to eat but then you'd also have time to take naps so definitely more than four hours it, like we were meditating for 10 and a half hours a day and we're able to get more than four hours of sleep so i see this as pretty unnecessary and a lot of people thought or we're kind of wondering about maybe that was being done intentionally to cause sleep deprivation. Manipulation and deprivation of sleep is a form of behavioral control because it makes people unable to think as critically and therefore they're easier to manipulate and influence. But I also watched a video from a woman who recently went to one of his advanced retreats and she said that they started meditating at 6 a.m. It sounded like most days, um, but maybe like one or two days towards the end they had to start meditating at 4 a.m. And so I believe maybe because of the fact that not everyone's accommodation was at the place that they were meditating at, or like the main retreat events were held at, um, Michelle maybe had to get up as early as 3 a.m. to like get ready, you know, get dressed, all that stuff. Um, and then transport to the meditation at 4 a.m. So I don't know if they were only getting four hours of sleep every single day. Um, and this woman also never mentioned meditating for five hours straight. She made it sound like they started meditating at 6 a.m. usually and then they had breakfast. So I assume like they weren't having breakfast at, well, 6 to 7 to 8, 9, 10, 11 at 11 a.m maybe it happened like once or twice that they meditated for five hours towards the end. I don't know. I don't know. Then she also says that she saw angels but gives no further explanation for that. So I don't know if she means it literally or meta metaphorically or what's going on. I don't know if I would say this is a cult tactic but it's definitely something that is weird and atypical, right? I think in general the way Michelle speaks in these stories makes her come off as somebody who is not totally themselves. I think I feel this way because I've noticed that a lot of people who are into or influenced by new age beliefs tend to speak in a very similar way. Like everything has to be made into a magical story. Like nothing can be boring and dull from time to time. Everything is just like this beautiful flowing story and just the way you talk has to be poetic, kind of. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's just something off about it to me. And I think to somebody who's not very familiar with New Age stuff, the way she speaks maybe would sound a bit kooky, I think is the best word to describe it. Cult-like influence is not always done intentionally, so it's like, I'm never saying that any of these things are, I believe they're done intentionally. Like, Joe's trying to create a cult. I don't believe that. Again, I'm not super educated in cults. This has all just been my opinion. But I don't really see how a seven-day long retreat could be considered a cult. Like, it, there might be cult-like things taking place there. There might be aspects of a, a cult present. But just because you have a couple aspects there doesn't make you a cult. Like, I'm not seeing any informational or emotional control. Not that there isn't any. I just don't have any evidence of it. I believe the key element that's missing is a little more effort to keep the people in a certain group or place. Like, all these folks are going home after these seven days, and they may still be following Joe's teachings and whatever, but I, so I don't see how this could be any sort of cult other than maybe a cult of personality around Joe. Not saying that that is how it is, that that's my belief. If it was a cult, it would have to, I think, be a cult of personality rather than like a cult around this particular retreat because 
it's seven days long, you know? <laughs> Moving on though, when Michelle talks about the man in the wheelchair, she is talking about coherence healing sessions. On Joe's website page, he says, when a group of people come together with the intention of healing another, and they know how to get beyond themselves, connect to the quantum field, open their hearts, and demonstrate brain and heart coherence, we now know that they can heal one, other, one another. To me, it reminds me of faith healing a little bit, but these can also be done remotely. There are multiple autonomous groups that are like authorized by Joe on his website, um, where you can like book a remote a scheduled coherence healing session, which will be performed by advanced student volunteers on Zoom. Like one of the groups, for example, apparently the volunteers open their hearts, get into coherence, follow the formula mentioned earlier, energetically connect with you and sing you a healing song on the Zoom call. Um, but also they're not the ones that heal you apparently. The responsibility of the healing is still yours. We are simply connecting with the unified field of all possibilities as a conduit to support you. It's always important to have a loophole like that um, for when it doesn't work out, you know? I see this a lot in probably not just the New Age communities, a lot of like supernatural or mystical uh, practices. You'll see people, a common one I see is, well, this blah 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 isn't going to work for you if you're skeptical. So you have to have an open mind and you have to believe that it's going to work. Um, and it basically is just a way of putting the blame on the person when it doesn't work so you don't have to take any responsibility for it maybe not even being possible. Joe claims that his coherence healing has caused people with cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, Parkinson's disease, and rare genetic disorders to go into remission, and even tumors disappear before our very eyes. We have witnessed blind people see, deaf people hear. We have observed hundreds of healings from a wide variety of health conditions that were not responding to any treatment. First thing I think of when I hear claims like that is, why are we not going around to hospitals curing people there? Children's hospitals, I'm sure they'd love to have folks come in and heal all the kids one by one. Why is that not happening? Um, another thing is, you know, people who claim that they can heal others, you'll never see them healing amputees, helping them regrow limbs. Never. How come? Like, shouldn't that be possible? If you can cure blindness, deafness, cancer, why can't you help somebody regrow a leg or an arm? Well, I think probably because there are other things that can cure deafness, blindness, or cancer, um, and then you can just attribute them to the coherence healing, the faith healing, um, whereas we don't know any way that we can regrow a limb. Also, you can fake that those things have been cured. Somebody can say that they've been cured of cancer when they haven't, or they can think that they have when they haven't. You can also fake having those things in the first place, which people do. It's a lot harder to fake not having an arm one day and then you start to see it regrowing and i think that's why we are really only seeing certain things being healed majority of the time like there's a ton of vague stories about people for in various different methods of m magical healing people in wheelchairs getting up and walking and standing and whatever why is that such a common one well i think it's probably because not everyone who's in a wheelchair cannot stand or walk at all. Like wheelchairs are not just for people who cannot use their legs at all, who are like completely paralyzed or whatever. There's a lot of reasons for uh, needing a wheelchair and for some people it's just hard for them to walk or they can't stand for a long time or whatever. But when you're at this event with tons of people and all this good energy, you know, in the room and you feel so inspired and you you see or believe that all these other people are being healed of these things there's so much adrenaline that it might make it a lot easier for certain people in wheelchairs to stand up and start walking when it maybe is nearly impossible for them to do that uh in general i think it's possible that adrenaline and the placebo effect could play a role in some of the feelings of healing that these people experience you know say you have a lot of back pain but you're a big fan of joe's and so you know coming to this retreat like you've heard all these healing stories so you know when you go you're gonna be healed you just know it like you are you have very strong conviction that it's gonna happen to you and so your time comes to be healed you go in and you it's just the adrenaline the energy um, and the expectation that you're going to be healed that makes you have this feeling 
of the pain being gone, like a temporary feeling of relief. And you go around telling people, I'm healed, I'm healed, like it, it worked. But then maybe a couple hours or days later, the pain slowly starts to come back. So it's like, what do you do at that point? Do you tell people? Um, do you just keep it to yourself? Some people might feel like uh, the, the healing did work, but then they did something to mess it up again. So it's their fault. Or they're in denial that the pain came back because they just felt so strongly that the coherence healing worked. Like those, those are many possibilities and I'm not saying that's what it is, but it's just, I guess we gotta wait till the proof section to see if there's any actual evidence besides stories that coherence healing is real, is backed up by science. But before we get to that, we're gonna talk about Dispenza's personal healing story, which I've kind of gotten the impression is what started all of this journey for him. In many different interviews and documentaries and whatever, Joe has talked about um, the event that made him want to spend the rest of his life studying the mind-body connection. So, in 1986, he was on the cycling portion of a triathlon and was hit by a car from behind. Six of the vertebrae in his spine were compressed. This is called a spinal compression fracture. He says, the prognosis was that I'd probably never be able to walk again and I needed radical surgery called the Harrington Rod Surgery. In another video clip, he specifies that the doctors told him he'd probably never walk again if he didn't have the surgery. He also later says in the video that the doctors were absolutely clear that I'd never walk again. So maybe, I hope I'm not being like pedantic, but he kind of changes the story slightly from it being like, oh, he'll probably never walk again, to he'll probably never walk again if he doesn't get the surgery, to he'll definitely never walk again. Um, so I don't know which one it is. <laughs> Instead of getting the surgery though, he decided to check himself out of the hospital with just the thought that the power that made the body heals the body, and he was determined to heal his injury on his own with just the power of his mind. In one interview, he says that he believes there is an intelligence in each of us, and intelligence is consciousness. Consciousness is awareness. Awareness is paying attention. So therefore, he figured that his spine or his body, I'm not sure which, he doesn't specify, uh, was paying attention to him, which meant he should pay attention to it. So what he would do was he would, I guess, just lay there, you know, like he had a spinal compression fracture, he couldn't move. So he would just lay there, I think on his stomach and mentally uh, reconstruct all the vertebrae in his spine one by one, trying to do that without losing focus the entire time. But he would always lose focus and would have to start over. I don't know why. It reminds me of when I was a child and I thought that in order to get a tan, um, like when you lay on tan, you had to lay completely still. And if you moved at all, like just to like itch yourself, then all the progress was lost and you had to start over again. Like I, I don't know how he got the idea that he needed to mentally reconstruct his spine completely without losing focus. But that's what he did. And six weeks in, he says that he finally mentally reconstructed them all without losing his focus. And that's when he started seeing significant changes in his body. Four weeks after that, so 10 weeks after the initial injury, he was back on his feet. And two weeks after that, so 12 weeks after the initial injury, he was back training again. I assume training for a triathlon? I don't know. He says one of his doctors was blown away at the fact that he healed without surgery. This story is one of the most frequent things that I've heard about Joe. Like many people have commented about him on my videos and bring this up as evidence for what he promotes or just for the ability of the mind to heal the body in general. I mean, it's a pretty crazy story, right? Like doctors said that he would never or probably never walk again, but he was on his feet walking in 10 weeks without surgery. How else could that have happened than the way that he promotes it happening? Well, maybe it's because spinal compression fractures usually heal on their own in about three months. He was walking in two and a half months and training in three months, so that's pretty spot on with the typical amount of time. I do assume that his particular compression fracture was more severe than many of them, so maybe it is still pretty um, impressive that he healed in such a short amount of time. Maybe it's like more minor ones that only heal in three months. Also, there's like a million stories of people who doctors have told them they never walk again and then they did. And it's like, 
doctors must just be telling everybody <laughs> this because I hear stories like this all the time. I, I mean, I'm really glad he recovered and was able to do so without, without surgery. Um, it sounds like he doesn't experience much back pain anymore, so I'm happy that it worked out good for him. But I don't think that this says really anything about mind-body connection. You know, even if hypothetically it was not common to heal spinal compression fractures um, without surgery or in the amount of time that he did, we still can't say what caused it to heal, you know? You can't just assign a cause without demonstrating a causal link between it and the effect. Having no other explanation is not evidence for the best thing you can come up with. One anecdotal story does not go very far. Scientific studies do. Thankfully though, Dispenza does want to back up his beliefs with research. Joe says that after more than 10 years of independent research on individuals who have studied and applied this work, we have amassed a vast amount of data, measurements, case studies, and testimonials of supernatural proportions. On his website, he has a tab called Proof, which contains two sections. There's scientific research and stories of transformation. I don't care if this sounds nitpicky, I don't think it is, but you should not be using the term proof in this way. Like, science deals with evidence, not proof. Uh, even if it did, personal stories are not proof. They're evidence, and specifically, bad evidence. Again, anecdotes are not valuable in this sense, so I'm not going to be going over them. They're not worth anybody's time. I don't have any way of validating them. I mean, you can find anecdotes for every mystical thing out there, and you can find anecdotes for things that contradict other anecdotes. Ane two anecdotes that can't uh, coexist together. And so we're just going to be looking at the scientific research portion, portion, which the page lists four case studies, four research news and update articles, one presentation, and two published scientific articles. What I've been taught is good proof, or more accurately, good evidence, is peer-reviewed scientific studies published in reputable journals. I'm not going to waste everybody's time by going over research that hasn't been published and therefore may not be able to pass uh, the peer review process. If it's good research, they should be submitting it to a journal. If it's not in one, how am I supposed to gauge the quality of it, you know? So looking at the four research news and updates things, the first one just talks about research that they've been doing with UC San Diego, which they said would be published in January 2022, but I don't know what, where it is, it's not on the research page. The second one talks about some research with UC San Diego as well, but it doesn't look like any of it has been completed. It's instead, it says that the research group is currently designing experiments. The third one is about one of the scientific studies that we're going to talk about in a bit. And the last one mentions a study that they say they hope will be published in early 2021, but again, it's nowhere on the page. So basically, what three out of the four of these are like is, we're working on stuff right now. So it's great, but it's not evidence for anything, right? The next on the page is the four case studies, and these annoyed me to no end. Like, they're just videos which you cannot skip forward or backward in. So if you miss something, you gotta start the video over. If you wanna skip a part, you can't. That's, you're watching it start to end like you're at a movie theater. <laughs> um, and it's basically doctors talking about graphs and results from different experiments, but I don't understand why we're not getting this information in the form of a peer review paper or anything readable at all like that. That's just annoying. I, mean, I know I'm a YouTuber. I'm making a video here. I like watching videos, but if I'm going to be watching a video about some studies, I want to link to the studies. I want to link to anything readable so I can look at them, and especially because you can't speed this up. Like, I hate not being able to speed up videos and not being able to skip forward or backward is just ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Um, so I'm not going to go over those like is stupid. Next is Dr. Hemel Patel's presentation from a July 2021 advanced retreat. As much as I would absolutely love to watch an hour-long video about graphs and medical stuff, that again I can't speed up. Although this one you can skip forward and backward um, and I'm not sure why because it seems like it's the same video sharing platform for these and the case studies, but there's no indication to me that any of this information in the presentation has been peer-reviewed. Again, there's no link to anything readable. If, if this stuff is of any quality, why can't I get any of it in a PDF? Like, is that so hard to provide? Finally, we get to all two of the published 
peer-reviewed scientific articles. Um, I know that this is like an incredibly overwhelming amount of studies, um, but please bear with me. So basically what I want to do is read the abstracts from both of these studies, and I'm going to leave out the results part of the abstract, which might sound weird, but like none of the terms and numbers and abbreviations in that part of the abstract is going to make any sense to any of us who are watching this, um, but the results are followed by the conclusion in an abstract, and the conclusion part is going to like it's using wording and terminology that's going to make sense to us and basically explain what the results mean. So I, I feel like if you want to see the results, you can look at the screen. The whole thing will be on there. You can read the whole stuff if you want. It'll be linked in the sources below. I'm going to try to read these a little bit slower. Uh, not that I'm like the fastest talker ever, but I hope you can like get a grasp for what they're saying with all these terms. So the first one is titled, Large Effects of Brief Meditation Intervention on EEG Spectra in Meditation Novices. It was published in 2020 in a journal called IBRO Reports. From what I can tell, this is a reputable journal. Dispenza and five other researchers are credited in the conflict of interest section. None of the authors declare any conflicts except for Joe. It says he may be remunerated, paid for the meditation training examined in this paper due to expertise, was not involved in the analysis in this paper to avoid bias, and below it says that Joe was responsible for the conceptu conceptualization and methodology of this study. So let's read the abstract. This study investigated the impact of a brief meditation workshop on a sample of 223 novice meditators. Participants attended a three-day workshop comprising daily guided seated meditation sessions using music without vocals that focused on various emotional states and intentions. Based on the theory of integrative consciousness, it was hypothesized that altered states of consciousness would be experienced by participants during the meditation intervention as assessed using electroencephalogram EEG. Brainwave power bands patterns were measured throughout the meditation training workshop, producing a total of 5,616 EEG scans. Changes in consciousness were analyzed using pre-meditation and post-meditation session measures of delta through gamma oscillations. Results suggested the meditation intervention had large varying effects on EEG spectra. Findings provided preliminary support for brief meditation in altering states of consciousness in novice meditators. Future clinical examination of meditation was recommended as an intervention for mental health conditions particularly associated with hippocampal impairments. And then I also want to read one of the lines from the conclusion of like the main part of the study. Findings suggest that brief guided meditation intervention may offer positive and immediate health benefits to help combat stress. So let me know if you perceive something different, but what I got from that is that it's saying that Meditation can change states of consciousness and help with mental health conditions and stress, but it's like that seems like something that a lot of people already knew. <laughs> also, they say that this study lacked a control or comparison intervention. An experimenter allegiance and bias may have been present in delivering the guided meditation. Finally, this was a convenient sample making it highly vulnerable to selection bias and the potential for sampling error. For those who don't know, the type of sampling that you use for a study, like the way that you find the people who are going to be participants, is important and some methods are better than others. Like convenience is kind of obviously one of the easiest, but it's not very good for the reasons that are listed in the study itself. But it doesn't really matter to me either way because I just don't see what is like I don't see how this study shows anything that kind of wasn't already consensus or like well known or agreed with. It doesn't talk about anything mystical. Like we already know that meditation helps with stress and like it, it could help with mental health and change your state of consciousness, which is vague to me. It might be explained in further depth in the study and I'm just not able to understand it because I'm not like not super uh, educated on this specific topic. I don't know if I'm just misinterpreting the study or what. You can let me know your thoughts on it below, especially if you're more educated on like reading studies or whatever. 
but I'm gonna move on to the next one. One minute deep breathing assessment and its relationship to 24 hour heart rate variability measurements. It was published in 2019 in Heart and Mind Journal, which also seems like a very reputable one to, reputable one to me. Like neither of these journals have been ones that you can just tell right off the bat are mainly trying to promote alternative or mystical types of ideas. So that's good. In this article, Joe does not declare any conflict of interest. The abstract reads, background, heart rate variability, HRV, the change in the time intervals between successive pairs of heartbeats is influenced by inter interdependent regulatory systems operating over different time scales to adapt to psychological challenges and environmental demands. Low age-adjusted HRV is predictive of upcoming health challenges in healthy people, as well as a wide range of diseases in patients and correlates with all-cause mortality. 24-hour HRV recordings are considered the gold standard and have greater predictive power on health risk than short-term recordings. However, it is not typically cost-effective or practical to acquire 24-hour HRV recordings. This has led to the growing use of short-term recordings in research and clinical assessments. Objective The first study examined the correlations between a 10-minute resting state period a one-minute paced deep breathing protocol, response to hand grip, and 24-hour HRV measures in 28 healthy individuals. Based on the results of the initial study, the primary study examined the correlations between one-minute paced deep breathing assessment and 24-hour measures in a general population of 805 individuals. Conclusions? The findings from this study suggest that the one minute paced deep breathing protocol is an ideal short term assessment that can be used in a health risk screening context. When low values are observed, it is recommended that a 24 hour assessment be conducted. For me, this study makes me think okay, cool. Deep breathing can help in a clinical setting or research setting to determine whether the longer, more expensive method of me measuring. HRV for 20 hours is necessary or not. But again, like that's great. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm happy that they've been doing studies on this stuff and it can help people and whatever. But what does this have to do with anything Joe is promoting? How does this support or provide evidence for any of his mystical beliefs? Like breath work affects heart rate? Is that how it's relevant? I don't know how it's relevant. Um, other than he promotes doing breath work and this has to do with breathing. Y'all will have to let me know if I'm dumb and just not seeing the revolutionary information in these studies, but to me, I feel like I don't get it. Like, he's been doing, apparently, research on his fringe beliefs for 10 years and this is all that's come out of it in terms of peer-reviewed research studies published in journals. Um, like, one study saying that meditation can help with mental health, stress, and can affect consciousness or change your state of consciousness. And another one that says that one minute of deep breathing of breath work can help in a clinical setting regarding who should or shouldn't get a longer assessment of heart rate variability. I thought there was supposed to be a vast amount of data. Like, what am I missing? Why is this the only stuff that he has posted on his website under proof that is like research? like actual research, not videos that you can't skip around, not a presentation from a doctor, not a statement that they're going to be producing studies that haven't been produced by the time they said they were going to be. Um, it seems like, I mean, if you read like the description of his books, he makes it sound like he shares a lot of research that he's personally done um, out on in these books, but why are they not on the website? Why are these the only two things that have made it into journals and all the other research he's done, supposedly done, hasn't. Joe likes to use this phrase, this little catchphrase, evidence is the loudest voice. But let me tell you, I don't hear it. So my final thoughts on Joe Dispenza, I believe that he wants to help people get healthier and feel better and live happier lives. And I'm 100% positive that he has helped many people do that. And that's awesome. I'm sure his message is very helpful for many people with chronic illnesses and disabilities. But 
I do think it can be harmful for some people with those things. You know, I'm not disabled, but I want to read a review from someone who is and wrote a review for his placebo book and they said, for me, a disability rights advocate and educator and a person who has lived with a lifelong chronic illness, there is an important element missing in the book. Those of us with disabling conditions are learning that we are not defective, nor must we be cured of our condition to have a life that has value. In fact, my experience has been that everything I used to think was wrong with me has turned out to be what was right with me. My illness has taught me how to live creatively and effectively in ways that perfect health never could have. And yes, I continue to consider approaches to improving my health, as my reading this book suggests, but I do it from a place of self-acceptance now, rather than a belief that finding a cure is the only valid outcome to my exploration. The author doesn't express such a view, but my decades of work in the disability arena have shown me that most people still consider disability to be a tragedy, and some believe it is a fate worse than death and use that as the lens through which they would read a book such as this. And of course, it's not bad um, to look for ways to improve your health or desire to be cured of something, but the thing is, I don't believe in his little faith healing shenanigans, and so I think it can provide false hope for people, and I think there are some things in life that you can't change, unfortunately, and you have to learn how to accept them. I think this comment that I saw in a video criticizing Joe Dispenza, I think this sums up how many of his followers kind of think. The person says, I turned my life and health around thanks to the methods learned from Dr. Joe Dispenza. I never read any of his papers or reviews <laughs> and just paid and watched his live events. I was very sick and desperate for help since no conventional doctors could help me. I cannot deny that all the scientific explanations by him about the brain make so much sense. Thanks to the methods taught by him, I am now a healthier, happier, and calmer person whose heart is finally open. This individual has not read any of his papers or probably done any research, but just the way he talks about the science makes so much sense to them. They were desperate, so they gave him money, and now they're healthier and happier. No details about that, not that it would matter if it wasn't so vague because it's just a story from a YouTube comment. But this is a common theme in many of my videos. Um, you know, many people start following figures like Joe Dispenza because they are desperate. They've tried so many things um, to try to heal themselves or become happier, um, have more fulfilling lives. They've tried all the conventional methods, so they start going to the more alternative routes, the mystical, the supernatural. Other people have predispositions. They already believe um, that alternative methods are superior, and so they are attracted to Dispenza and his teachings. And both groups kind of have their own reasons for most of them not really doing any research. I think for a lot of these people, like they consider just listening to what Joe says as their research, like they feel like that's sufficient. They don't try to corroborate any of his statements, especially because he just says, oh, we've done so much research on this, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he has a research page on his website. Most people aren't going from, okay, he says he's done research, let me try to find it. Okay, here's the page, let me read the studies. A lot of people just aren't doing that, especially when you're desperate. That's not what you want to be sitting there and doing, reading scientific papers, like that's so much fun. I have to say that I like Joe Dispenza more than Deepak Chopra. Um, they both preach about kind of similar things, like being calm and meditative and all the spiritual stuff. But Deepak, you know, he gets a little snippy and passive aggressive sometimes. Whereas I feel like Joe Dispenza, never gets even slightly upset. Like, he just seems like a really chill guy. So I respect that. I also kind of feel like he believes the stuff that he teaches, like for the most part at least. It's not like a super strong belief that I hold and you couldn't convince me otherwise. Um, but, you know, I don't think he would try to like do all this research. I'm sure he's done other research that he talks about in his books, but it's like, I don't know. I don't know why he doesn't put it on the website. I don't understand that. But I'm sure he's done other research, and so I don't think he would spend all this time doing that stuff if he didn't actually actually believe that these studies would uh, provide evidence for the things that he believes in. I think it would just be a waste of time. I know a lot of people bring him up as one of like the only kind of educated people that talks about the stuff that he talks about, the mind being able to heal, heal things, the mind being able to um, create 
the exact desired life that you want and whatever. I see a lot of people, a lot of his followers, every time they mention him, it's gotta be Dr. Joe Dispenza. Every time he mentions himself, oh, I'm Dr. Joe Dispenza, great. I mean, happy for him that he got a doctorate in chiropractic, but it's like he's using the title doctor to make him sound like he's educated in fields that his doctorate was not in. Um, he's not talking about chiropractic stuff, so why does he need to be referred to as doctor all the time? I mentioned that he was a doctor at the beginning of the video. Did I have to say Dr. Joe Spenza every single time I say his name? No, but that's what other people do, and that's how he refers to himself a lot. Um, and it, it kind of feels like it's used to make him sound more educated, on these topics than he actually is. Although apparently his postgraduate training has been in all these fields that he talks about, there's not very many detail, details on what that means that I've been able to see. And even so, the research just isn't supporting these things, or at least the research that he's providing on his website isn't supporting coherence healing. We are not seeing studies being done that are showing that you can heal people of blindness, deafness, um, reverse Parkinson's MS cancer. None of the studies talk, none of the two studies talked about that. That's all I have to say. I'm sorry if I sounded like I'm repeating myself. Next, I'm going to be talking about medical medium, I think. That's my plan right now. Um, so thank you for watching the video. Please let me know your thoughts down below. I'd love to hear your perspectives. Um, whatever you want to say about Joe Dispenza, his teachings, your experience with them, whatever. Um, yeah, that's it.